Well, welcome to today's webinar on uh, tips for successful deployment of water level loggers. My name is Paul Gannett, and I'll be sharing some of my experience with you today. Uh, and I thank you all for joining us. Just a little bit of uh, housekeeping to get started. Uh, I'm going to try to do it in about 50 minutes and leave about 10 minutes. Uh, for questions at the end. You can feel free to submit questions as we go along. Um, uh, I may address some of those questions during the, uh, during the webinar if it's an appropriate time, uh, but uh, others I'll save you know, for that, that question and answer session at the end. Um, to enter your questions, you just enter them into the uh, questions panel in your uh, control panel. You should all see that. So. Make sure you know where that is. And I also want to say that we are recording this webinar, so uh, uh, you can, um, we'll be sending out a link to it afterwards and uh, you can refer back to it. So just a little bit about Onset as we get started. Uh, we uh, are the manufacturers and the designers of the Hobo data loggers. We're located here on Cape Cod in Massachusetts and our whole focus is on data loggers and we've been doing it for you know quite a few years now we were founded back in 1981 so um we will um uh we've we've got a lot of experience and i just got a question here on uh getting copies of the presentation uh we will send a link out to uh the presentation immediately uh, or shortly after we complete it takes a little bit to download it and send that out but we will send you a link to the webinar. Just a brief introduction of, of myself. I'm the principal Hobo product manager. I've been with Onset now for uh, some 26 years, and I've worked with our engineers to develop our line of Hobo data loggers for environmental monitoring. And uh, I helped introduce our first water level logger back in 2005. And uh, we've continued to expand our range of water level loggers since then. And, uh, you know, those have uh, been very well received uh, by users. I uh, work with our sales teams and our technical support teams, uh, providing support for them uh, as, as needed and training. And I've worked with a lot of uh, our users as well. So a lot of what I've pulled together today is... Um, uh, is, is based on that experience uh, working with users and, and our tech support team. So first off, I just want to start out with a little bit uh, of a, a quick survey just to find out a little bit more uh, about uh, what you're involved in. So if you could, uh, let's see, I'm trying to, oh, I know what I did, okay. Let me launch this survey. And uh, what I'm asking is you to enter in the types of environments, and you can enter in multiple choices to um, uh, say what kind of environment you're monitoring water levels in. And if you don't see an appropriate choice there or you want to add another application, you can just fill in that other uh, environment in the questions uh, box in your control panel, Just uh, and I'll, and I'll see, uh, uh, see your applications there. So good. We're getting a good uh, cross-section. Let me, uh, let me, uh, I think we've got a good idea here. So let me share the results so you can kind of get a cross section for your fellow uh, attendees. Uh, by far the, uh, the biggest uh, group of you are doing streams, rivers, and lakes, a fair amount of groundwater as well, a little bit of coastal waters and some stormwater systems. Not too much in the irrigation field, that's, that's okay. Um, but oh, I've got somebody also doing tank levels. Yep, it's important to monitor those. Uh, okay, good. So what I'm gonna do now is hide those results and you should be seeing uh, my presentation again. So here's the agenda for uh, today. First, I'm just gonna give you a quick overview of the Hobo water level loggers. Uh, then I'm going to uh, go into preparing for deployment, 
and uh, especially in the mounting options. What I'm going to do as, we, as I go through this is there's areas where I, I especially get a lot of questions. I'm going to spend a little bit more time on those and then the other areas that I don't get as many uh, questions, I'm going to just kind of go a little more quickly through those. Um, let's see. So then I'm going to be talking about how to, to uh, uh, deploy the loggers. I'm going to start with the U20 uh, standalone uh, water level loggers first, uh, going through how to configure them, taking reference water level measurements, data retrieval, uh, kind of you know take go, take you through the full process from start to finish, and then uh, I'm going to talk about our MX 2001 uh, Bluetooth loggers, and uh, I'm going to kind of get through that a little more quickly because a lot of it's the same as what we've covered uh, for the uh, U20 series loggers. So just uh, for those who aren't familiar, uh, I just have one person. We said they're not getting audio. Is anybody else uh, having problems with their audio or just confirm that you are getting audio real quick, somebody? So, uh, nope, good, thank you. Got a confirmation. So the audio on this end is working. So uh, uh, if anybody's not getting audio, check your audio settings. Okay, great. Um, sorry for the digression, but I just wanted to make sure I wasn't talking to myself <laughs> that, I was, that you guys were able to hear me. Uh, so we have uh, we group our loggers into standalone data loggers with uh, our self-contained U20 uh, series loggers with the optical readout, and then we have our direct read uh, MX2001 series standalone loggers. They have Bluetooth readout with the Bluetooth in the head up at the top, and then the uh, water level sensor that goes down into the water. We also have uh, some IoT stations where you can get the data through the internet at any time, get alarm notifications. Um, I'm not gonna be talking too much about the uh, IoT stations. So uh, I, I just wanted to let you know that they're available, but uh, uh, we're gonna have a full enough webinar just talking about standalone uh, logger deployments. Now, some of what I talk about for the standalone loggers will also apply to uh, installing uh, sensors and, and dealing with data from the uh, internet enabled stations, but I'm really going to be focusing you know, mainly on the standalone loggers today. But just for those of you who are interested in, in web based remote monitoring, uh, there's a couple other webinars on our website that you may want to be aware of. One's uh, specifically talking about monitoring flow, and, uh, and, and that also covers uh, water level monitoring as part of that. And we also have one on uh, dam management with. Uh, with some of the concerns uh, and uh, deployment considerations relative to dam management. So they're available on our website, which is a great resource. So starting out with just a brief overview of our uh, U20 series loggers, we actually have two uh, series within this series. One is our U20L series, which are in this uh, polypropylene housing. And then we have our uh, U20 series with stainless steel and titanium housings, um, and two, diff you know, two different types of housings there. They both series carry some common uh, features. They're, they're non-vented, which makes them especially easy to deploy. We'll see some of that when we look at the deployment scenarios. They have optic uh, communications for reliable offload and date in wet environments uh, to use these you need barometric pressure data to compensate for barometric pressure changes and uh, we just recommend using the 13 foot model of either series for doing that barometric compensation and these loggers also uh, record temperature uh, focusing in on the u20l series uh, they're uh, they, they have pretty good accuracy typically around 0.1% of full-scale measurement. They have great prices. These prices, any prices I refer to are in US dollars. So they start at uh, 360 US dollars, uh, three different ranges, and the polypropylene housing is suitable for fresh or saltwater environments. The, uh, the metal housing, uh, U20 series loggers, uh, their advantages include their smaller diameter, 
Uh, they're less than an inch uh, in diameter. They have slightly better accuracy. They include a three-point NIST traceable calibration certificate, and they have four different ranges. They've got a deeper range for the higher pressure situations. For using both of these series of loggers, you need to use either our optic base station or waterproof shuttle. Uh, the base station is great for configuring uh, the loggers in the, uh, the lab before you head out. Um, but the waterproof shuttle can also be used as a base station, and the waterproof shuttle is especially useful out in the field uh, when you want to uh, offload the data because it will automatically uh, offload the data and relaunch the loggers with a synchronized restart. Uh, so you can immediately redeploy them. It does require the Hoboware Pro software. We have a couple different versions of Hoboware software. You need to use the Pro version with the shuttle. And as I mentioned, you can also use the waterproof shuttle as a base station for configuring and offloading uh, data. So at this point, uh, I want to start talking about preparing for deployment. These are things you want to be thinking of ahead of time. And really, the, the most important thing about planning for deployment is making sure or, or thinking about how you want to mount them. You want to mount them uh, so that they are remain in location and as the water level uh, goes up and down above them uh, so that they can get accurate readings. So there's, these are kind of the most common methods, and I'll talk about each of these in more detail on the following slides. So, so wells, post mount, or mounting it on like a concrete block. So first looking at some stilling well examples, lots of different ways you can configure these. Uh, here it's mounted on a uh, pier in a, uh, uh, a saltwater bay or a marina actually. And you can see just ordinary PVC pipe mounted to the side of the pier with a bolt to uh, hold the uh, suspension cable to the loggers. A pretty simple and uh, but reliable way of, of deploying water level loggers. Here's a, a case where it's mounted, uh, the stilling wells on the side of a boulder and uh, next to a staff gauge quite often, uh, especially yeah, in the stream environments uh, or, or dams, for example, too, you'll have a staff gauge nearby, which will be your kind of your reference uh, for your uh, water level measurements. Uh, going over here to the right side, uh, for fast moving streams, this is uh, something to consider where they've actually used a, um, uh, power drill uh, to uh, drill bolts, leg bolts into a rock and then mounted rebar on top of that and then attached a uh, PVC stilling well to that rebar. So that's uh, you know, something you may want to do if you're a fast moving stream. I noticed uh, somebody was asking about that beforehand uh, for a fast moving stream. This is a, a good way to, uh, to really securely mount the uh, the uh, the loggers. So you, you do need to plan for accessing the loggers from the top to be able to install them. Oh, and the other thing in this case is they drove the bottom of that rebar into the bottom of the stream. So you only have to attach it on the on the top side with this sort of deployment. Here's a uh, a flume for monitoring stream flow, and it's a little hard to see, but on the upper edge of that flume, there's a stilling well that's built in to the flume. Um, the, uh, you know, the logger gets uh, set in that and it's got a little hole that connects the, um, uh, that stilling well on the side to the, the flow of water there. And this is a good way to measure uh, the flow of water in the stream. So that's pretty common as well. And this is one that actually uh, I hear a fair amount. It's people wanting to uh, mount water level loggers in shallow applications such as flood irrigation in rice fields or vernal pools. Uh, in, in this case, uh, you, know, you don't have to go very deep, but you want to, uh, you know, basically you put the PVC pipe into the soil and uh, you want to use uh, slotted PVC pipe for this. 
and it should be really fine slits in the uh, the PVC pipe. So once it, you can't see the light through, so there's different grades of PV uh, slotted PVC pipes. Uh, you want to have the real fine slits, or just like razor slits. Uh, you want to suspend the logger a little bit above the bottom of the well, so it doesn't uh, the nose cone of the, the water level sensor doesn't end up in silt that might collect at the bottom of the well. And in some cases, you may need to add uh, soil fabric around the water level logger in the well to keep the um, uh, the port and the water level logger from clogging with silt. So just some things to keep in mind. Uh, also, you probably want to put a, a drive point on the end of the uh, the PVC pipe so that you can you can kind of drive that into the soil. And another thing about this deployment is this water level may you know, it can go above the well because you're just measuring pressure. It, and uh, in a lot of these cases, if it's uh, a vernal pool, for example, this can uh, get flooded, that, and that, that's okay. Um, it'll just uh, it'll accurately record the water level changes. Um, some considerations for mounting these in wells. Uh, you want to use a cable that won't stretch uh, during the course of the deployment. Uh, uh, we sell a, a Teflon coated braided stainless steel cable, which is great for that. Uh, and the nice thing about the Teflon coating is it keeps the cable from kinking as you're deploying it. Uh, kinks could, you know, ch you know, alter the length of the cable slightly as they straighten out, so you don't want to have kinks in your cable. You want to plan for data offload, some way to remove the well cap so you can pull uh, the loggers out for data offload. Typically you'll want to put a vent hole in the top of the well for venting it to the atmosphere, because typically you'll have one barometric pressure logger in the area with multiple uh, wells around it, and uh, all those wells need to be uh, vented to the uh, atmosphere if you want to share that barometric pressure logger between them. On the other hand, uh, it is uh, perfectly okay to have a sealed well where the barometric pressure logger is in the well in the air above it and then the water level logger is further down in the well and it will just measure the the differential pressure within that uh, that well so you, you don't always need a vent hole but it's something to uh, to consider as you're as you're planning your deployment um, and then certainly make sure you do uh, take appropriate measures to prevent the the tip of the uh, water level sensor from getting buried in silt. You, you don't want it to uh, get so clogged that it uh, affects the pressure readings. So that's something you just kind of keep track of during the deployment um, to, just to make sure that it's staying fairly fairly clean. A little bit of fouling is not going to be an issue, but if the, 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 the vent hole to the pressure sensor gets clogged, that's a problem. I want to talk a little bit, this is skipping ahead to the uh, MX2001 loggers. Um, you do have to be cautious in certain uh, shallow water applications with mounting these loggers. The, um, the MX2001 loggers have a, uh, a vent for the barometric pressure at the top of the well, uh, or at the top of the logger, I'm sorry. And you don't want that to be in a continuously uh, humidity saturated environment. And so you want to, if, if your well is one of these dripping wet wells, you need to isolate that, that high humidity area from the vent. We actually include this gasket with the uh, MX2001 loggers, which is a two inch gasket, um, which is, is probably one of the more common uh, well sizes. And that basically creates a seal uh, that keeps the high humidity area down below the seal. And then you put a couple of vent holes in this area above the uh, the seal to um, um, to allow air air to circulate th through there to keep the moisture down. So that's just something if you if you've got these shallow water tables, you know, short wells with high humidity, it's something you do need to do when mounting these loggers. It, if it, it's not possible to avoid the continuously saturated environment, we recommend using our our, our sealed U20 or U20L water level loggers. Oops, did I make sure I didn't skip? Okay, yep, I didn't double click on that. Yeah, when um, another method of mounting loggers is on a stake, 
you know, this is a nice way of mounting loggers because it's, it's real simple. You just buy, you know, you can drive a, um, a tea stake into the bottom of a stream, which is, is real common. That's it's a little hard to see in this upper picture, but that's all this is, is, is a tea stake driven into the bottom of the stream, or in this case, it's an estuary. And the logger can be mounted right to the side of that. Uh, you know, you can add a, a PVC housing to add additional protection and act as a stilling well. The um, one thing you have to be careful with the stake mounting is you don't want to use it in a, a place where there's boat traffic. You don't want boats hitting your uh, your stake in the ground. Um, this is another type of what I consider to be a stake mounting. This is for uh, the USGS uses uh, water level lockers for monitoring hurricane storm surges. So they look for anything they can to uh, that's going to survive the hurricane storm surge and mount our loggers to the side of those. In this case, it was mounted to a telephone pole, but even then you can see the telephone pole uh, got tipped over a little bit. Another way of mounting uh, water level loggers is in a um, uh, kind of a stilling well that's attached to uh, either a concrete block or a cement slab. That's what this is. This is a nice deployment where they actually, uh, you know, mold these uh, cement slabs and they, they mold the uh, steel attachment rings right into the men's, uh, cement slab when they make them and then they can attach the uh, uh, the loggers to the side of these these rings so that's a nice system and it's you know keeps it on the bottom of the the stream or estuary so that you know boats are not going to run into it and it also keeps them hidden so uh, it helps uh, avoid casual tampering which sometimes happen you know is uh, people get curious. Uh, the tricky thing about when you mount them on the bottom like this is you need to know where they are. So use GPS to record the locations. You might want to have some sort of marker attached to uh, a stake on the on the shore just to kind of follow down to the uh, uh, to your loggers. Take some pictures. Here's another uh, uh, trick we hear some people doing too is. If you've got a cement block and it's in a stream where you can get a lot of flow, uh, what you can do is actually pile up some local rocks around the cement block to help hold it in place during those high stream flow events. So that's uh, something to, to keep in mind. And mounting your barometric pressure logger is, is also uh, important. You want to uh, mount it in a place that's not going to go through a lot of uh, temperature extremes because that can affect your accuracy. So you certainly don't want to mount it in the sun because <laughs> uh, uh, that, that's going to affect its accuracy. Uh, typically to, to give it better temperature stability, uh, people will mount them right in the same well with one of their loggers because the ground around the uh, barometric pressure sensor will keep it at a nice stable temperature. You get the best accuracy. Um, uh, you can also, you know, mount it in an area that's shaded. Um, I want to, uh, I actually, I got a picture of that on the next slide. You know, just here's a uh, common way of, of mounting them as you're putting it on a tree and uh, notice that it's on the shady side of the tree. Um, let's see, I'm just coming back here. Um, oh, we typically say that you want to be within 10 miles and a thousand feet of elevation uh, difference uh, between your barometric pressure logger and your water level loggers to get you know, you know good barometric compensation. So that covers a pretty good range with one barometric pressure logger. You can also import barometric pressure from a nearby uh, weather station, but just gets a little trickier to bring it in. So I usually recommend just using uh, one of our U20 loggers to record that barometric pressure. And I'll show you in a little bit, you know, what it's like to use that uh, barometric pressure uh, data in your in our software to get the water level data. So that's giving you some ideas for mounting. Hopefully uh, that covers uh, most of your, your application environments. It's just, you know, there's a lot of ways of mounting these. And I know you guys have to get pretty creative <laughs> to figure out what works in your, your case. So now I'm actually going to go into uh, using our um, 
our Hope Aware Pro software for configuring the loggers. And that's the first step. So you can do this in the office or in the field. It's usually easier to do it in the office. Um, and here's just some of the things you want to do. You, you want to give the logger a name where you can recognize you know, where it's going to be deployed. Uh, so that, that really helps with uh, processing the data afterwards. You, you know which logger has which data, but you do need to make sure that you deploy the right loggers in the right locations as you go. Um, you want to make sure you've got good battery status. Um, you, so we, we show you that in the software. Uh, of course, you always need to log both pressure and temperature. Uh, the temperature is really important for the temperature compensation of the, uh, the water level data. And down here, you set up when it's going to start. Uh, you want to start either at interval or at a specific date and time. We have an option for starting now. Typically, you don't want to just start now because your your data is going to just be kind of at a whatever random time you are you're starting at. So it could be if you're logging every five minutes. What you want to do is you want to log it at uh, 10 o'clock, 10:05, 10:10. You know, at nice even intervals. You don't want to be starting your five-minute intervals at uh, 10.02 and a half. You know, it just, it just makes it a lot easier to process and correlate the data if you use either at interval or date time start. So once you've set your logger up, you can um, uh, you click this key, which is going to say delayed start. And uh, just another little tip here. Um, this is a time savings tip. If you're launching a bunch of loggers, what you want to do is under your Hubbleware preferences for your logger, you want to use this, what we call a launch time savings option, where you can have the, the contents of the previous launch for that logger type used to fill the launch window uh, uh, for the next logger you deploy. And that just ensures that you start them all at the same time with the same logging interval. So it saves you time and ensures consistency. Next thing I like to do is, uh, you know, especially as I'm deploying the loggers, I want to make sure that they really are uh, logging. And there's a couple ways to do that. One is uh, usually the most common way is to there's a little LED that flashes every four seconds when the logger is logging, or it flashes every eight seconds if it's waiting to start logging. And uh, it's you, know, you just kind of look in the end of the logger. You probably most of you have seen this. Uh, looks like a little face, and that little red smile is uh, flashes every four seconds or so. You can also use uh, status in Hobleware to check that the logger is logging. You can see the current values. You can see, uh, you know, current status. It's launched and logging, so that's a nice confirmation as well. So. Well, as you're launching the loggers, uh, it's really important to always take a reference uh, level measurement. Uh, and this is an area where I get a lot of questions, so I am going to uh, spend a little bit of time on this. Uh, one of the first questions you have to answer for yourself is, uh, what is going to be your reference point? Is it going to be the, the surface of the ground? Is it going to be the top of the well? That's probably one of the more common uh, reference points. Uh, sometimes you want to uh, reference it to sea level. Um, now, if you're going to use sea level as your your measurement, then you've got to uh, your reference. Uh, you're going to need to survey in the tops of your wells. But a lot of you are have done that or are doing that anyways. When you're out in the field, you're probably going to use the top of the well ca casing as your reference, and you may have to just adjust the the reference water level that you enter into the software later in the process to reference it to uh you know whatever you want to use as your ultimate reference so yeah i'll talk, uh, talk a little bit more about reference measurements in the following slides as well the other thing you need to do is allow time for the logger to reach temperature equilibrium it takes a little you know a few minutes uh when the logger is first inserted into the water uh to reach temperature equilibrium so you want to allow doing that uh, so once once the logger's down there, you wait five minutes, say, um, and then you take your reference water level measurement. Uh, you jot down what 
uh, your reading is, the time, and the date in your field book, because you'll need that later. And uh, uh, you'll need that later in Hubbleware Pro to do, uh, for it to do its magic of calculating the actual water level readings. There's common ways of doing the uh, reference water level measurement using a, uh, uh, a tape like this on a reel. It's pretty common. It beeps when it hits the water level surface. You may want to measure it a couple times just to make sure you've got the, uh, uh, you know, you've got a good reading on that. Another common way of uh, checking the current water level is with a staff gauge. Uh, this is probably not your typical staff gauge because it's uh, you can see it's actually three staff gauges, but I just I kind of like this one. This one's actually a, uh, at a, a stream in uh, Slovenia, but you can see depending upon different levels of, of uh, water flow, they, they you have to choose the appropriate uh, staff gauge to use. Um, and in some cases, because you really can't get into the you won't be able to get into the stream to get a good reading on the staff gauge. You might want to have some binoculars to, to read exactly where it is on the staff gauge. Another challenge that you can have when reading the staff gauge is the water could be a little turbulent around the staff gauge. So one trick that people use is to take some you know, PVC pipe and create a little kind of temporary stilling well on the downstream side of that pipe uh, uh, so that you get a uh, more steady, uh, water level to read. Uh, another trick is you can take read it a couple times and take an average of those readings. So getting a good accurate water level reading at start is important for the accuracy of your data. Uh, other options if uh, there is no staff gauge, uh, sometimes you can find a boulder or a bridge. Uh, you just pick some mark on that to uh, uses your, your reference level and you measure down to the water level surface. Or in this case, you can see in this picture, uh, she's using a, uh, you know, there's a, a rock on the bottom of the stream that's uh, uh, she's using as her reference for water level measurements. Uh, just make sure you consistently use that same uh, rock as your, as your reference and uh, so that you can compare your before and after uh, reference uh, levels. So just a couple other notes for um, uh, entering in your reference water level readings. Uh, quite often, or in most cases, you've got water present, so you're just measuring from your reference point, in this case, uh, or using the top of the well as a reference point, you just measure down to the, uh, to the water level. And um, when you enter that into our software later, you're gonna enter that in as a negative uh, water level measurement, because you're, your it's the water level is below your reference point so the way uh, our software processes the data it wants to see that as a negative water level um, there's also cases though where you're not going to be able to um, the, the water levels below the the sensor this is a case in things like vernal pools or uh, if you're doing flood irrigation like in rice fields i hear this um, the water level may not be present. What you want to do in that case is get a good measurement of the distance from the top of the well to where the, the pressure sensor is in the logger. It's not at the very end of the logger. You got to go where the, the measure to where the pressure sensor is within the logger. You enter that in as a negative distance into our data assistant later on. And what that will do is any time the water level rises above that pressure sensor, it will record that water level correctly. And then any time the water level is below the pressure sensor, just flat lines. You know, just it can't tell whether it's a foot below or two foot below. So you could also make your water uh, well deeper so that it goes down deeper. But in some cases, you don't care about you know those lower water levels anyway. So it's fine if it flat lines at those points. And another trick uh, that I like to use. I'm a visual guy. Uh, sometimes it gets a little confusing between the, uh, the you know, how to enter in the, the water level correctly, the reference water level correctly. So I'll, I'll draw a little picture. So this is just a little example. If you want to get the, the distance of the water level below the, the ground level, you can do that as measure, two measurements, one uh, from the top of the well to the water level, and then a second measurement 
uh, from the top of the well to the ground, and then you just subtract them. So simple stuff, and the picture helps keep all that straight. So, so I've kind of gone through the deployment, uh, installing the, the water level loggers. Now they're out there for a month or whatever time period. Now you want to come back and get the data. Uh, as I mentioned before, I really like using the uh, uh, the data shuttle, as this guy's uh, doing, to retrieve the data. Uh, it does uh, automatically relaunch uh, the logger with, this, you know, with a synchronized uh, relaunch. So if you're logging every five minutes, it will continue on that same five-minute schedule. Um, I did get a question I saw here in the um, in the questions come through. Well, what if you don't want to start again? Um, the in this case, if you're using the shuttle, yeah, it, it doesn't give you that option. But what you can do is take your uh, so it'll just start logging again. But you can still bring the logger back. It doesn't it doesn't hurt to be logging when you know, you're capturing meaningless data. Uh, but you could also take a laptop out into the field uh, and just offload the data stop the logger or in some cases you might want to just have it continue uh, to, to uh, capture data in that same data file you can do that as well so you get the choice when you have your laptop out there of either stopping the logger or not uh, and, and whether you restart the logger or not so the, the laptop will give you a little bit more control um, the uh, the other thing uh, this is this is important is I always take another reference water level reading at the end of the deployment. Uh, it uh, gives you uh, a, a backup reference water level in case you, you found something happened during your deployment and that your your, uh, your initial reference water level is not a good reading. Uh, it's a great way to verify the accuracy. Uh, so, you know, sometimes the uh, water level logger will shift during the deployment. So you can process part of the data with the initial reference water level, and then you can see the shift in the data. Um, then you can process the data after that with the, uh, the, the, the water level reading from the end of the deployment. So sometimes it takes a little bit of, you know, butzing with the data to get it, but it'll, uh, that second reference water level reading gives you a lot more options to process the data. Um, and then when you, you don't need to see that, uh, when, uh, after you launch the logger, you do want to take another reference water level reading in case it shifted. Now, if you've just gotten one and you, you can see that the water level hasn't changed at all, you know, then you don't necessarily need to uh, take another reference water level reading. Uh, use your own judgment on that. And the shuttle, uh, uh, it gets downloaded when you get back to the office. Uh, uh, you can offload up to 63 loggers at once. Yeah, there's just a, just to make sure it's clear. There's some, uh, Shane was asking, uh, uh, will the shuttle offload throw off the, the logging intervals? You know, for example, if it's uh, uh, logging every five minutes, uh, will it, uh, uh, suddenly start logging at 10.22? And the answer is, is, is no, it does, uh, doesn't does do that. It does a synchronized relaunch. So if it was logging at 10 o'clock, 10.05, it'll continue logging at, at uh, uh, 10.15, 10.20, keep you on schedule, which is important for putting your data together afterwards. So now I wanna just kind of walk through the processing of the uh, the, the data, once you've, you've, you've offloaded your loggers, you're back in the office, you've got your barometric pressure data file uh, as well. Um, when you, uh, so all you need to do is click on the, uh, the, the data file for the, the, the logger that was in the water. So I double click on that, it opens uh, that file up, brings you into Hoboware Pro, and here's the choices you'll get. Um, um to to process your data is actually you know what i think it skipped the screen this is what you'll see when you first uh open the data file it'll show you that you've only had pressure and temperature then you go into the barometric compensation assistant and then you uh click on process then it brings you to this screen 
I got a, and you want to t enter in your water type, whether it's fresh water or salt water, or uh, we also have a, a, an option for deriving the, the density from the temperature channel as well for the best accuracy in fresh water. Uh, so usually that's what I use for streams. Uh, you enter in your reference water level and you also have to enter in the reference time for that water level. Then you associate the uh, barometric pressure data file and you want to make sure to choose a, uh, a point in that barometric pressure data file where the loggers in the water and has reached temperature equilibrium. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple slides. And so once you've set this up, then you just click on create new series down here at the bottom. And that'll basically, uh, there'll be one intermediate screen, but then you'll see a plot of the data. And here you can see the water level in green. And here's the raw data file. So this one of the dashed lines is just the, um, the barometric pressure. This, this upper line, the, the dark solid line is the, actual water pressure data so you can see how the, the software has done the magic of calculating the water level uh, from that and you can really see well this is where we had some sort of rain event that raised the water level so that's um, that's how you process the data um, to check that your uh, logger had reached temperature equilibrium so you might want to zoom in now, this is all in the Hoboware Pro software. This blue line is the temperature data from the logger, and you can see uh, that it didn't reach uh, temperature equilibrium until this point here. So I'd enter this time in as your uh, reference water level. I'd use this point. And then you can export it as a Hobo project file because remember your raw data file only has pressure and temperature. After you've gone through and processed the data, uh, you can save that as a Hobo project file, which will include the water level data. And that's important uh, because that's usually what you're looking for is the water level data. And you can also export it at that time as an Excel file or a text file. You can kind of choose your format. So that's the process with the U20 loggers, and um, hopefully that's that's fairly clear. I know I went through some of that fast. Uh, I actually do see a question here, which I'll answer now because I, I've seen this come up uh, a, a few times. Is can you enter multiple reference water levels? And um, the answer is um, yes. What, what you can do is process the data with one reference water level one time. And then you take that same data file, you open it up again, and you process it with a different reference water level. And, that, and there's different cases where you want to do that. In some cases, you might want to have the water level reference to sea level. And then the next, but you might also want to look at it relative to itself, the local stream conditions. So um, you can really process that same raw data file as many times as you want with different reference water levels to look at the data different ways. Um, so yeah, that is a nice, nice option to have. So now, just in the interest of time, I'm going to go on and talk about deploying Hobo MX 2001 water level loggers. You know, just a quick recap: these have Bluetooth in the uh, the top unit, which uh, uh, you can offload with a mobile device or a Windows device. Um, it means you don't even need to, if it's a plastic cap on there, like the well cap that we sell, you don't need to remove the well cap or the logger uh, to access the data. Um, this logger also includes a barometric pressure sensor, so you can uh, get the water level data directly. You don't have to do that processing of the data afterwards, so you still do have the option of processing the data afterwards if you want. Um, and, you know, yeah, as I mentioned, you get the water level data directly. And it has different sensor options you can put on the bottom of it uh, for salt water or fresh water and different cable lengths that you can uh, uh, choose, uh, custom cable lengths as well as standard cable lengths that we sell. So uh, it's actually uh, easier to deploy these generally. You just have to install the logger 
uh, allow time for it to reach temperature equilibrium. Oops, another double click. The uh, one thing I wanted that happens sometimes is your cable's too long. You can uh, wrap it on itself like this and shorten it and, and then use, I recommend at least uh, three zip ties to, to tighten the cable. And that's a good quick and dirty way of shortening the cable. And it, it's, uh, it, you know, the zip ties will lock it in place pretty well. You do have to be careful not to wrap the cable too tight at the ends. It shouldn't be any more than one inch in diameter. And then the software for this is, you know, this is uh, right now I'm showing screenshots uh, from uh, an iPhone. Uh, this is what it looks like on the uh, iPhone, similar for Androids and Windows environments. The um, So when you open up Hobo Connect, it will show you the different loggers within range. So here's my water level and barometric pressure logger down here at the bottom. So I select that by tapping on that. And that'll bring up, this is kind of the, the master screen for once you're connected to a logger. You can see all the different options. If I'm configuring it, I select this one here, configure and start. And this brings up a, a screen that looks like this. You give it a name, you select your logging interval. It will tell you how long uh, it will last uh, at that logging interval. Uh, before the memory is full. There's a couple other options down here um, for your, your logging modes, which uh, you, you kind of scroll down to see them. And I had some questions in advance about that. Uh, people were asking about waves. We have a, what's called statistics logging, which will give you a, a way of averaging out wave action to a certain degree. You got to be careful if you're, uh, you're logging at too fast a rate. Um, uh, you, you can fill up your memory pretty fast, so but you can maybe log at a or, or sample at a 30 second rate and then log over a five minute interval, and that will log out or, or average out most of your uh, wave action. Uh, so that, that, that statistics mode is something uh, to keep in mind if you're in a wavy environment. It's after you've configured your logger, it comes back to this screen that I showed you before. So it's the same screen. Um, you'll, this is where you enter in your reference water level. You, you select this icon down here for calibrate, because basically you're calibrating the logger as well as setting the reference water level. And that'll bring up this screen where you enter in your reference water level. Uh, you choose the units, and here's where you, ch you choose the density. Uh, once you've entered that, then you save it. So it should be logging at this point because you've started the, the logger as part of that, that configuration screen. Um, and you know, you just at that point you just uh, let it log. Um, you can check it at any time to make sure that it's still providing reasonable data during the deployment. That's a nice thing about the Bluetooth readout. Um, now Fast forward ahead, we're reading out the data. So this is that same screen I showed you before. You know, I've connected to the logger. I want to read out the data. I select this uh, uh, icon here on the right for downloading the data. That'll download the data. And then it'll sh show me another screen now to, um, to see the data, what I actually want to do is disconnect from the logger, and that'll bring me back to this screen, the kind of the mass, uh, the logger select screen. And down here at the bottom, you'll see an option for data. Uh, I click on that. That'll open up my data file. I can, or, or give me a choice of choosing data files, and I can choose the appropriate data file for this logger. I can see, you know, uh, my water level data. Uh, you can do this in the field. That's one of the great things about having the um, uh, the software run on in the mobile app. The this is uh, oops, I, I jumped ahead here. You see these three dots up here in the upper right. You click on those to open up another kind of a little drop down menu, which gives you some more options, uh, such as I can change my reference water level at this point if I want to change that. Let's say I, I discovered I didn't do it right. You know, for some reason I can change it here. Uh, I can export the data, which uh, is a pretty common thing to do. So let's say I collect on that. 
I get the same choices as I had with Hoboware to uh, export it to uh, uh, an Excel file or a CSV. I think. Um, so we've covered the, you know, the the, the retrieving the data. Just a, a couple other pointers. Uh, again, uh, taking the reference water level reading at the end of each deployment, you can use that as a uh, a way to to check that the data is accurate in your file, uh, and I would recommend that. Uh, you can also set uh, Hobo Connect to automatically upload your water level data to Hobo Link, and that's a great way to back up your data and provide web access to your data. So uh, to do that, you enable that in the settings of Hobo Connect. So I am just uh, I'm looking at the time. Uh, I said I'd leave about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, I think I've only left nine. <laughs> so I did address a couple of questions along the way. So at this point, I am going to take a look at the questions that have been coming in. Thanks for everybody for sending in your questions. I'm going to probably not have time to answer all of them, but I'll see if I can find some common ones. And hold on a sec while I expand my window. Oh, here's a, uh, a common question is uh, should the logger be installed vertical or at an angle or horizontal? Um, yeah most of my pictures I showed the logger being in a vertical direction but because it's just measuring pressure it really doesn't matter uh, what the angle of the, the logger is. It, it'll me measure pressure, whether it's horizontal or vertical. A lot of times it's easier to uh, install the logger uh, vertically if you're installing it in some kind of well. But if you're installing it like on a um, uh, cement block or a slab on the bottom of the stream, it's very common to have those, uh, like a PVC housing that's mounted horizontally and that will still provide good accurate measurements of the um, uh, the water level changes. And let's see, what are there, some other good questions? Um, there's a question on um, if uh, they use the barometric pressure from a, a nearby uh, Hobo micro station, with a, um, a barometric pressure sensor, is the accuracy of the level uh, measurement still the same? And 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 yes, um, you you bring in those data files, and um, uh, the, the um, especially if it's a hobo station, the uh, software will be able to bring in that data, do the same processing that I showed you using a, uh, uh, a U20 barometric pressure file, but it, will, it can do the same thing with a a barometric pressure file from one of our stations and the accuracy will be the same uh, using that. Again, you want to make sure that your barometric pressure sensor is uh, you know, not in direct sun so you can get the best accuracy with that barometric pressure sensor. The, there's a question here of no, and I, I don't know the answer to that one. Some of these questions, I think we're gonna have to follow up with you individually. We may just have to have our tech support team follow up with you. Uh, just get a little bit more information to uh, to answer them. Uh, here's here's a fairly common question: Is uh, any tips for winterizing U20s and creeks that could freeze up? Uh, it is pretty common to uh, use these loggers, and especially this time of year, uh, or a lot of some people will leave the water level loggers deployed through the winter so that they can see some of the uh, stream behavior uh, as they're freezing up or when they're thawing out. Um, now it is possible that the uh, freezing stream could damage the logger, but uh, in general, especially our U20 loggers in the metal housings, uh, they withstand the freezing just fine. As soon as the water thaws out, their accuracy uh, is, is you know they, they still meet their calibrated uh, accuracy and um, they have a very durable uh, ceramic sensor that uh, you know withstands freezing. Um, 
you know, I would recommend putting it in some sort of PVC housing as an, uh, as kind of an additional degree of protection in a stream, you know, if it's freezing, it's just because, yeah, the more you can minimize the amount of force that's uh, being exerted on the logger, that's better. But I would definitely use our, our metal loggers for any streams where you're worried about them freezing up. Let's see. Yeah, just there was a question on, you know, if you use the uh, the, the uh, time start feature, you know, where you set up a specific date for them to uh, start logging, that um, can you see the LED blinking? Um, yeah, I just wanted to get confirmation that, yes, you can see the LED blinking, but it's only every eight seconds when it's waiting for that delayed start. So you got to be a little more patient to wait for that uh, uh, you know, that blink. Another trick that I use when I'm looking at, the, you know, for that LED to blink is I'll actually cup my hand around that communications window so it's a little bit darker uh, around that window so that when it uh, blinks, I don't miss it that way. That helps. Um, let's see. There's a question here about flow configuration. That's uh, uh, bringing up the point that uh, a lot of times they're using the water level data for uh, monitoring stream flows. And uh, we do have uh, a webinar on uh, monitoring uh, flows uh, using our, our our station loggers. So that's got some good tips on uh, you know how to use these loggers for uh, monitoring flows and flumes and weirs uh, and, uh, and, and, and streams using a discharge curve. So those are all common ways the data is used. The, um, that particular webinar I'm thinking of is using our real-time stations, but we also have a white paper on using data loggers for uh, monitoring flow. So I'd look, look up that on our website. That's a, uh, a pretty useful uh, paper, and it, especially focus, that white paper focuses especially on our MX2001 loggers. So, so check that out. Let's see. I'm definitely not going to get to all these questions. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I think I got time for maybe one more. Oh, here's a good question. Uh, can you sync the um, water level data with a rain gauge? And um, yeah, uh, you know, some of you may know that we also sell rain gauge loggers, and they. Um, uh, we'll, we'll log the rainfall. It's actually event-based, but we have a filter in our software that will convert that event-based rainfall data to time-based uh, rainfall data so that you can look at it you know, as rainfall over every five minutes, one minute, whatever interval you choose, and then use those timestamps to align the water level data and the rainfall data. Uh, likewise, you can use rainfall data from one of our stations and, and line it up with the, uh, the timestamps. So um, at this point, I see I'm just about out of time. So I just want to take a, a brief moment to refer you to our website. I've referred to this a couple times uh, during this, this webinar. Uh, there's a lot of great resources. We've actually just redid our, our, our website and um, I'm trying to make it easier to find the, uh, all the different resources. They're under support and applications. You know, the applications area, uh, focuses on you know you kind of taking an application view of of what you can do uh, with with Hobo Data Loggers. The support section has the white papers, other webinars. So uh, definitely um, uh, check out our website for these kind of resources that might be valuable. And also we have uh, you know, uh, people that can answer your questions over the phone. So if you're in the U.S., you can use our 800 number, or uh, anywhere in the world, you can use our uh, 508 number, so feel free to give us a call. We're always happy to talk to you. And at that point, I see that I've hit my my one hour. So I, I, I do want to uh, thank you for attending today. Hopefully, I've answered uh, many of your questions. I, I, I think there's something we didn't get to. We'll try to follow up with you 
and answer those questions that I did not get to. Also, as you exit the webinar, uh, we have a screen that uh, offers you a chance to uh, share your feedback. We'd love to hear your feedback, uh, as, as well as indicating you'd like further follow-up. We're happy to follow up with you. So um, thanks again for your time, and uh, hopefully uh, you've learned some good, good things out of this. So take care.